In this strange time of isolation and fear, I thought I would spend some time researching and then sharing information about the history of epidemics and pandemics. Hopefully, in this way, people might learn a few things about history and also get the sense that far from being strange or unusual, suffering bouts of debilitating disease is actually a very human experience. I will focus on several specific cases, each well documented and each having a devastated impact on the population affected. As well as the sheer death toll, epidemics have also had profound social, political, economic and military consequences, which often reverberate for many years afterwards. I plan to go right up to the Spanish flu pandemic that began in 1918. But I will begin with one of history's first known epidemics, one that ravaged the greatest city-state the world has ever seen and at the height of its glory. This takes us back almost two and a half thousand years to Athens in 430 BC. Athens in 430 BC was probably at the zenith of its power, in its golden age. It was also, in all likelihood, on the brink of defeating Sparta in the Peloponnesian War. The Pentacontitia, a period of 50 years, as Thucydides called it, between the allied Greeks' victory over Persia and the beginning of that war, saw Athens become the dominant state in the Greek world and witnessed the rise of the Athenian democracy. For Athens, this was the era of philosophers like Socrates and Xenophon, playwrights like Sophocles, Euripides, Aeschylus and Aristophanes, history writers like Herodotus and Thucydides, the great sculptor of the Parthenon and indeed the Elgin marbles, Phidias, and famous statesmen such as Pericles, Themistocles, Simon and Cleon. Really, this plague could not have come at a worse time for the Athenians, who, as I said, had also just embarked on a supremacy-defining war against their Spartan rivals. Strangely, though, just 50 years before, Athens had been evacuated and destroyed during the Persian invasion. So, how did they make such a great comeback? Let's get a broad picture of Greece in the 5th century BC and how conflict between Athens and Sparta brewed. We can start with the second Persian invasion of Greece in 480 BC. Wishing to avenge the Greek victory at Marathon 10 years earlier, which ended his father Darius's invasion, and after years of planning, Persian King Xerxes finally launched his invasion of Greece. With a large navy for support, he crossed the Hellespont, known as the Dardanelles today, and marched through Thrace and Macedonia into Thessaly. The Persian army crossed into Pythiotis, and their navy moved into Artemisium. The Greeks blocked their path on both fronts, but after a spirited defence of Thermopylae, as seen in the famous film The 300, the Greeks there were overwhelmed. The navy then retreated, but managed to evacuate Athens to the island of Salamis. The Persian army now moved through Boeotia, occupying Attica, while their navy pursued the Greeks to Salamis. Then things began to turn. A large part of the Persian navy was destroyed by a storm, and at Salamis, the Greeks scored a decisive victory, preventing the invasion of the Peloponnese. In September, however, Athens finally fell. King Xerxes ordered the city to be torched, raising the Acropolis and destroying the old Parthenon. Numerous statues were destroyed by the invasion and they survive to this day, known as the Persischut, Persian rubble in German. The city was temporarily reoccupied by some Athenians the following year after the Persians withdrew to Boeotia, but following the breakdown in peace negotiations, Mardonius, Xerxes' cousin and brother-in-law, who he had left in charge of the invasion, reoccupied the city and, according to Herodotus, destroyed any house, temple or wall left standing. Later the same year, 
the Allied Greeks assembled their largest ever army. They marched across the Isthmus of Corinth and met the Spartans at Plataea, defeating them and routing them from the Greek mainland. On the same day, across the Aegean at Makali, the Greek navy defeated the remaining Persian fleet and saw off the invasion for good. In 478 BC, having recaptured the city of Byzantium, the Greeks were divided as to their new Persian strategy. The Spartan-dominated Peloponnesian League, who had led the war effort until this point, felt that its aims had largely been achieved and sought to return home. They felt that long-term security for the Greek cities of Anatolia would be impossible. Spartan king Leotychidas even suggested transplanting all the Greeks from Asia Minor to Europe. This allowed Athens to replace Sparta at the head of the Greek alliance against Persia, as they asserted driving home the advantage into the Anatolian mainland. Xanthippius, the Athenian commander at Makali, asserted the Athenian commitment to protect the Anatolian and Aegean island states. A congress was called on the island of Delos to institute a new alliance against the Persians, hence the name Belian League. Its three main goals were to protect from future invasion, seek revenge against Persia, and to organize a means of dividing the spoils of war. Members had to contribute with men or money. Most chose money and the League members vowed to have the same friends and same enemies. Quickly though, this League of States began to transform into an Athenian empire. The city used the League for its own purposes, including the reconstruction of monuments and the enlarging of its powerful navy. The League's headquarters and treasury were even moved to Athens by Pericles in 454 BC. So Athens too was eventually resettled, but everything needed to be rebuilt. The reconstruction efforts were led by statesmen Thermistocles and later Pericles. The latter in particular led the reconstruction of the famous Parthenon, which of course still stands atop the Acropolis today. Of importance too were the Thermistoclean walls. Named after the Athenian general whose idea it was to construct them, they were defensive walls that protected not only the city but also its route to the ports of Piraeus and Phaleron. They guaranteed access to the sea even if the city was under siege. This alarmed Sparta, who attempted to prevent Athens building the walls in the first place. They argued that the city could be used as a vantage point for conquerors, and this could be dangerous to Greece as a whole if the city was taken as the Persians had managed previously. Although it seems more than plausible that the Spartans' reservations were more to do with their own ambition than anything like Hellenic protection. In 464 BC, an earthquake took place near Sparta. It destroyed much of the city and gave the enslaved helots a chance to rebel. The helots were the majority of the population of Laconia, the area around Sparta, and they numbered around seven times the population of Spartans, at least according to Herodotus. As such, keeping them under control was a constant issue for their Spartan overlords. Fearing the consequences of their rebellion and uncertain of their capacity to subdue it alone, Sparta sought assistance from the other Greek states. Athens responded and sent 4,000 hoplite soldiers to Sparta's aid. Sparta, however, dismissed these soldiers upon arrival, possibly fearing their loyalty and concern they might join the Helen uprising. Insulted, the Athenians broke off their alliance with Sparta, which had lasted several decades. But Athens retaliated. They allowed some of the rebellious helots to leave the Peloponnese and settle at their naval station of Nepauctus on the northern Gulf of Corinth. Five years later, war broke out between two of Sparta's allies, Corinth and Megara. 
Athens allied itself with Megara, seeing an opportunity to gain a foothold in the region. This led to a prolonged 15-year conflict between Athens and Sparta, often called the First Peloponnesian War. There were early Athenian victories, but after suffering defeat to the Persians in Egypt, they were forced to accept peace with Sparta and saw Megara return to the Peloponnesian League, but Aegina joined the Delian League. This peace was known as the Thirty Years' Peace, but it lasted only 15. In 433 BC, Corsia, an old Corinthian colony, modern Corfu, rebelled against Corinth, allying itself with Athens. The joint Athenian and Corsian navy prevented Corinth retaking the island and they were forced to retreat. A year later, in 432 BC, Athens demanded that Potadia, another colony of Corinth, but also a member of the Delian League, tear down its walls, expel its Corinthian ambassadors and send hostages to Athens. A large Athenian force turned up and defeated a combined Corinthian, Macedonian and Potadian army. Of interest, Socrates was actually also at this battle. Victorious, the Athenians laid siege to Potadia and eventually took the city. In the same year, Athens also accused Megara of desecrating the Hera Orgas, or Sacred Meadow. This was a fertile area of land between Athens and Megara, sacred to Demeter and Persephone. It was protected under religious law from contamination by people or livestock. They subsequently imposed trading restrictions on Megara's merchants that prevented them from trading at any Delian League port. It's likely this would have devastated their economy. As a response to the grievances of its allies, Megara and Corinth, Sparta called a conference of the Peloponnesian League later that year. Uninvited though, a delegation from Athens showed up and sought to dissuade Sparta from war. But instead, they contrived only to provoke them and the Spartans decided that the Athenians had already broken the peace of 445, and thus it was to be war. Sparta and her allies, with the exception of Corinth, were land-based powers with large, well-trained armies. By contrast, Athens and her allies were naval powers. This meant that a decisive battle was not forthcoming in the early stages of war. The first part of the war is generally known as the Archimedean War, after King Archidamus, the second of Sparta. Sparta did manage to gain control of Attica, but it could not impose itself on Athens because the city walls guaranteed access to its ports and thus allowed trade to go undisturbed. What did happen, however, was the Attican peasants fleeing from Sparta, attempted en masse to enter the city, causing the population to swell and for the city to become overcrowded. At the end of the first year of war, Athens held its traditional public funeral in honour of those who had fallen. And to close, the general Pericles gave his famous funeral oration. It was recorded by Thucydides and is believed to form the inspiration behind Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Fortunately for Athens, Sparta could not afford to occupy Attica for prolonged periods of time. They feared that the enslaved helots would once again rise up. And also, their soldiers were required to return home to participate in the harvest. Pericles sensibly opted to avoid open conflict with the large and well-trained Spartan army, and instead, relied on his fleet, achieving a score of victories, most notably at Napalctus in 429 BC, bringing overall victory in reach to the Athenians. But all was to be lost. The previous year, plague had already entered the city, and lasting four years, it would prove a far greater foe than even the deadliest Spartan. 
Since the beginning of the war, Athens had trebled in size. It was now densely populated with Attican refugees, and many of them had no shelter. Subsequently, it became a breeding ground for disease and squalor, and the population was devastated. The war effort annihilated. Pericles, his wife, and his sons all fell victim to the disease, and it's become noticeable or notable for its almost totally one sided effect in this conflict. Physicians, Thucydides says, were helpless and ignorant, many dying from contact with the victim, and conservative estimates place the death toll at around 25%, with some estimates as high as two thirds. The funeral pyres seen in the city caused the Spartans to withdraw, fearing contamination themselves. But already, many of the Athenian naval leaders and best soldiers had died. It took 15 years for the city to recover enough to launch an offensive itself, the Sicilian expedition of 415, but that too ended in disaster. Socially, the plague resulted in a mass breakdown of law and order within the city. According to Thucydides, men became indifferent to every rule of religion or law, not knowing what would happen next. Honour ceased, investments dried up, and frivolous expenditure was rife. Very few cared for the sick or the dead, fearing contamination themselves. Bodies were heaped together and left to rot or burnt en masse in huge pyres. Once it was understood that the survivors had developed immunity, they did become the predominant carers of the sick and the dying. Many too felt abandoned by the gods, as even the pious were struck down indiscriminately. They decided, therefore, there was no point in honouring the gods. Temples themselves became full of refugees, and soon with the sick and the dying. Others believed that the plague was a sign from the gods that they favoured Sparta, and thus morale suffered a double blow. This was enhanced by the fact that an earlier oracle of Apollo had apparently claimed that war with Sparta would come and bring pestilence with it. Thucydides himself, however, a sensible learned Athenian who rejected superstitious understandings of diseases in favour of the Hippocratic method, noted that the birds and beasts of carrion, usually eager for flesh, ignored the plague's many corpses and mostly left the city entirely. In 1994, a mass grave of nearly 1,000 tombs was found in Athens. It was just outside the ancient cemetery and is believed to be a plague pit from the 5th century BC. The bodies were randomly arranged with only a few grave offerings and no layers of soil beneath them. One group that was particularly severely hit was the Metics. These are foreign, non-citizen residents of Athens. Some, it seems, were caught fraudulently claiming Athenian citizenship, and they were punished by enslavement. Subsequently, the city developed stricter requirements for citizenship, which not only caused resentment among the Metic population, but also reduced the number of potential soldiers available to the army. This further compromised the morale of the already devastated civilian military. Athens military would never recover. Sparta would go on to take the city in 404 BC, forcing the destruction of the city walls, ending the war and toppling Athens as Greek superpower. It would never again achieve the same status. As mentioned earlier, Thucydides was present in Athens during the plague and he actually recovered from it. He described it as coming via trade from Ethiopia, down the Nile, through Lower Egypt, into Athens Port Piraeus, and then to the city itself. What about the disease? What was it? Well, unsurprisingly, we don't really know. Thucydides gives us the symptoms, but there are so many. Fever, redness and inflammation of the eye, sore throat and bleeding, bad breath, sneezing, loss of voice, coughing, vomiting, 
pustules and ulcers, extreme thirst, insomnia and diarrhoea. Traditionally, bubonic plague has been considered the most likely. The same disease that caused the Black Death and the Great Plague of London, especially given the Athenians trading economy and the growth of the city's population from 429 BC. This likely coincided with an increase in insects and vermin. However, recently this consensus has been challenged by suggestions that the plague could have been typhus, typhoid or even Ebola. It is of course also possible that the profile of the disease would have changed over time or that simply this disease no longer exists. In 1999, the University of Maryland concluded that typhus was the most likely cause of the plague. They cited the fact that it hits hardest during war and privation, has around 20% mortality and kills typically after around seven days. It also causes gangrene of the fingers and toes which matches some of the symptoms described by Thucydides. In 2005, the University of Athens examined dental pulp from an ancient Greek burial pit and found DNA sequences similar to those of the organism that causes typhoid fever. However, the University of California had disputed this finding, claiming serious methodological flaws and stating that the DNA might be some form of salmonella, but it's clearly not typhoid. Some of the characteristics of the disease, as described by Thucydides, are also in contrast to those typically associated with typhoid. For example, scavenger animals are not affected by the disease, and so it would seem strange for them to disregard the bodies of the deceased. Also, onset is typically much slower than seemed to be in the case during the Athenian plague and typhoid is most commonly transmitted through the poor hygiene of crowded urban areas, which mean that it would seem an unlikely candidate for a disease which, according to Thucydides, began in rural Africa. Given the fact that Thucydides specifically mentioned caregivers were of more risk, and that the Spartans did not suffer from the disease despite being in close proximity, some have favoured candidates that involve person-to-person -person spread. In particular, and also given its supposed origin in Africa, viral hemorrhagic fever, which is a diverse group of illnesses, has arisen as a possibility. Some of the symptoms described by Thucydides, including the fatal outcome by day eight, coheres with some of the viruses, like Ebola, and some historians have suggested that Thucydides might have meant hiccups with one of his symptoms, and this is also recognised as a symptom of Ebola too. Additionally, the persistent effects of reddened eyes in survivors of Ebola also matches the descriptions of the Athenian plague. Likewise, the 21-day incubation period provides for the possibility that the virus could have passed from Ethiopia via the Nile to Piraeus. Ancient Athens itself was familiar with Africa, at least according to the mosaic depictions, many of which show monkeys from Africa. Of course, monkeys were also responsible for transmitting the Marburg virus, a similar virus to Ethiopia, another VHF, into Germany and Yugoslavia in 1967. Of interest too, Athens was importing large quantities of ivory in the early 5th century from Africa. This was for Phidias's monumental statues of Zeus and Athena at Olympia, one of the supposed seven wonders of the world. Never again, in fact, in antiquity, would ivory be used on such a scale in the Greek world. Also hinting at VHF, we have the 1st century BC, or almost 300 years after the plague, but the writings of Epicurean philosopher Lucretius. He wrote that the disease was first characterised by, by having bloody or black discharges from bodily orifices. He gained such an insight from reading the works of Syracusian physician Acron, 
which unfortunately have not unfortunately have not survived but who apparently traveled to Athens to combat the plague and reportedly died there. It seems we may never know the cause of the outbreak. The failure of soft tissue diseases to leave a trace on the bones of their victims continues to frustrate historians and forensic anthropologists alike. What we can see in Athens though is a hint of things to come. Chaos, social disorder, and the breakdown of authority, and death on an enormous scale. We have seen the effects of an epidemic on the world's greatest city-state. Next time, let's fast forward 600 years to see the effect of a pandemic on the world's greatest empire. We turn to Rome in the time of Marcus Aurelius.